point of our summer Two Medicine Voices speaker series that has been exploring a variety of different uh, wildlife and wildlife connectivity issues here um, in the Crown of the Continent region, Glacier Park and Bob Marshall and Blackfeet Reservation. And, and uh, tonight, uh, which we'll get to in a moment, we're gonna continue with that, um, that theme as we look at wildlife moving across the highway to uh, BNSF Railway Corridor just south of here. But before we do, I'd like to share just a little bit about our organization who puts on the speaker series um, and then introduce our speaker to you tonight. So thank you so much for coming. Um, Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance is, we're a grassroots conservation organization that's based right here in East Glacier. And we work to protect lands, waters, and wildlife here uh, in this greater region with a primary focus on the Badger 2 Medicine, which is an area of national forest land immediately south of the park that has long been threatened by oil and gas leasing and that in addition to its incredible ecological values is also really culturally significant to the Blackfeet people. In addition to that, we do a lot of stewardship projects. We've got some work on trails and some invasive weed species this summer. We sponsor a variety of education programs such as the speaker series, um, as well as the summer walks program to help get people out on the land and experience and connect with it, amongst other things. So we'd love for, if you're interested to learn more about our organization, we have an info booth um, on the back there, um, you can learn more about some of our upcoming summer events, including the next um, installments in our speaker series later next month. Um, learn more how you can support us, sign up on our email list, um, or other ways to get involved. So please check out myself um, or Jordan, who's around here somewhere. Raise your hand, or if you're a board member with Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance, there's a couple of you in the audience, you can raise your hands and you can ask them some questions as well afterwards. Um, one of the things that we're working on and part of why we're very excited to welcome Tabitha Graves tonight, um, as many of you probably know, many of our areas like Glacier National Park, despite being over a million acres, are by themselves not large enough to protect um, healthy, vibrant wildlife populations over a long term, particularly larger mammal species like grizzly bears, for example. And so it's really important that as we think about the long-term viability of many of these species, that we find ways that they can move across the landscape. And our roads and our highways in particular have uh, particular challenges for many of our species, both in terms of maybe getting hit by a vehicle or being shy away at certain traffic volumes. And there's other issues that they prevent as well. So one of the things, you know, is we're here in one of the largest intact ecosystems in the United States, um, the highway that many of us travel on a regular basis that goes between the Flathead Valley and over here on the Blackfeet Nation um, has the potential to potentially limit the ability of animals in Glacier National Park, for example, to move into places like the Badger 2 Medicine and the Bob Marshall. And one of the people in this area who's been studying this, amongst other things uh, related to wildlife movements so most intently, is Tabitha Graves, who's a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey based out of West Glacier. Um, she did her PhD research, um, or at least her master's research, I mean, in the Badger 2 medicine, and has worked in this area on a variety of different research projects for over 20 years. I forget where she did her, her doctorate, if that was up here or somewhere else. But um, uh, yeah, we're very excited to have her and to share some of the lessons that they've been, uh, her and the research community have been learning about wildlife movements in this area and what it might mean for kind of long term conservation of some of these species. Afterwards, if this is you live in this area in particular and interested on how you can help us learn more about where animals are crossing or frequently being uh, hit on the highway, please see myself or Jordan as Glacier Two Medicine Alliance is starting a citizen science project to try to help researchers collect more information that can inform future mitigation efforts so we can ensure that this is a place where wildlife can continue to thrive. So with that, thank you so much for coming and I'm pleased to welcome Tabitha. Great to be here. I will just uh, get this started first. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so as, uh, as you mentioned, I'm Tabitha the Graves. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey. My office is stationed over, I'm stationed over in West Glacier, and I do work actually um, here in the here in Glacier National Park in the Crown of the Continent and actually up and down um, the Rocky Mountains across the West. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about some work that I've been doing in partnership with. Um, uh, the park. Um, John Waller is the carnivore biologist at Glacier National Park, and also with a whole lot of other people, um, the Blackfeet Nation, uh, the Prairie Salish Kootenai Tribes, the uh, Forest Service, lots of lots of other entities. Um, 
Uh, I started working on grizzly bears, and now I work on a lot of different things. Um, and this is a really, I, I'm just sharing with you a large, the results of a large collaborative project, and also um, some of the things that we're still doing that are still ongoing. So, um, roads. Okay, so there are lots and lots of roads in, in the U.S., um, over 4 million miles. Um, and those are utilized uh, by something like 246 million vehicles. And you can see that's a big number, and there's um, that's been going up mostly over time. Um, and of course, those roads have uh, large impacts uh, in terms of economics. There's over a million um, auto uh, uh, wildlife vehicle collisions every year, um, and of course, that leads to a lot of damaged cars, um, a lot of uh, money from insurance companies, uh, lives lost, um, 200 per year, and um, that the total cost um, of all of those uh, vehicle collisions is estimated to be over eight, I think that's billion. So maybe that's trillion? I don't know, very big number, very big number. That's the important thing. Um, and then of course, there's all of the habitat loss and ecological effects of, of highways and roads. And so uh, this is actually kind of an old number, but uh, there's well over 71 million acres of habitat that have been lost to primary highways. Um, and that's not even thinking about the habitat fragmentation, which is basically when animals can't go across those roads um, and the restriction of, of their movement. So um, I'm going to just like kind of jump right into grizzly bears because that's what I started working with. Um, when I when I did my master's at uh, University of Montana and um, started working with this very very large genetic project, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, but but basically this is a, a picture of grizzly bear locations from a study in 2004, and what we did was look at um, how whether there were distinct population groups. And so in 2004, we tried to group them together. This is kind of what they look like, each color representing a different group. And then when you put that on the map, um, and we compared sort of the really old data that we could find, so all of the all of the pieces of information, um, and then we looked at it in a more modern sense, the, the data, in the, the new data basically showed that um, some of those populations now look more like each other. And what that means is that they were mixing together more. Um, but not all, there are still some pretty distinct groupings, uh, or there were in the, at that time period. And so I want to talk about that a little bit more um, and, and sort of talk about why grizzly bears uh, in particular are kind of interesting. So um, one of the things that I've done is uh, build a family tree, and I'm just going to talk about basically how connectivity has changed over time. So the data set that I'm using is a genetic data set um, that I've used for a large part of my analysis on grizzly bears. Um, and so on the very left, you'll see there's a grizzly bear that that, that is going into what we call a hair corral or a hair snake. Um, and there was some sneaky stuff in the middle, and it, when it went under the barbed wire, it pulled out a little bit of its hair which we use to genotype the individuals. On this side, it's a bear rub tree, and this is a behavior that's um, natural for them. And um, we just took advantage of that and put some little uh, tiny pieces of barbed wire on those trees to be able to, to sample them and get their hair. And so um, this is the data uh, that I'm showing here is from 2004. And so you can see this is across a giant area going all the way from the Canadian border all the way down to Missoula. So, Glacier Park's just like the upper third of that, just for reference. Um, so this was a huge amount of effort, um, and we continued to collect data. This is the biggest 2004 data, but we continued to collect it um, all the way through to 2012. And so from that genetic data set, we had over a thousand different unique bears identified um, that we detected over across that time, over 6,000 times, um, roughly equal females and males, um, and we had a lot of blue side, which just means we were doing a good job at being able to distinguish one individual from another. Um, and with this genetic data, we don't get ages, but we did get, um, uh, we got each individual identified. Um, and sort of the short story of this, the, the, the highlight is that the diversity, the genetic diversity of these bears changed and increased rapidly over time. And so that's a very good story. So basically the population 
um, had very low numbers when they were when grizzly bears were listed initially, and then over time, um, as those numbers increased, uh, the genetic diversity also rapidly increased, and it did that not not just um, in one part of the the system, but across the whole system. So, so just to give you a little perspective on that. Um, the red are the most diverse, and the little blue dots are the least diverse. And we went from the picture on the left in 2004, where you can see over on the eastern part of the system on the eastern front, um, that was really pretty uh, not very diverse. There weren't a lot of bears uh, that were mixing in with all the other bears at that point in time. So, um, but then by the time we got to 2012, um, everybody looks kind of similar to each other. There's a lot of uh, genetic diversity there, and that's a really, really fast thing. Um, and we looked at why that happened, and the two biggest things that happened with that are um, that early on, there was really large effects from a, a few individuals. So so basically, um, I will tell you about the Genghis Khan of of grizzly bears uh, and all those amazing numbers of offspring. And then the other thing is that migration or movement or kind that we were talking about. And so I'll talk about that through this example of what happened in the southeast corner. So, so we made this giant family tree. Um, when I print it out, it's like 25 feet long. And so it has all the bears on there. I should have brought it. That would have been fun for y'all to look at. Um, and we can tell which individuals are related to each other because of this genetic. So, you know, you get half your half your genes from your mom, half your genes from your dad, bears do the same thing. And so we can use that information to, to figure this out. And so this is one of the areas that had a really big increase in genetic diversity across that time. And so in 2004, when we looked at this data, um, almost 70% of the residents were uh, offspring of just one male. So one male had, uh, like, nearly everybody was related to him and only two females. Um, that one male, when we put that whole family tree together, had 101 descendants. So that's the beginning of time. <laughs> that I was referring to. So he, you know, that's not just his own offspring, that's his offspring and his offspring's offspring and his offspring's offspring. Um, I think I had five different uh, generations basically represented in there, but quite a lot, you know, he was really a, a very, very productive individual. Um, and maybe that was because there weren't a lot of males there, hard, it's hard to know. Uh, there weren't a lot of bears there, so that certainly seems possible. Um, and then um, there were, uh, of, of his descendants, um, three of his offspring were really, really, really productive too. So, so that's why those, all those bears down in that area in 2004 looked very genetically similar, it's because they were all cousins, um, or more. We don't know exactly. We don't know what happened further back. And then the other thing that happened was movement. Okay, so so um, bears as the as the population started getting larger in the north part where we are um, and expanding, and bears started moving around in other parts as well. Um, we detected uh, more and more movement across time. So this I'm just telling you about this one area, but this was happening in other areas too. So in 2004, we had uh, 14 bears that we detected that had moved into there. So again, those were the all the, basically all the individuals that were related to that one bear. <laughs> so they brought some, some fresh bear blood in there. Um, and nine of them were from further away. But by 2012, sort of the last year of our genetic study there, uh, we had uh, a much larger 26 immigrants, and um, which was only 36% of that population, but that's because the population was also growing at the same time. So, so those two things um, were the main uh, drivers of this, this big population of bears in what's called the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, this area going all the way down to the Zula um, for that area. So I want to go back now to US 2 and, and talk a little bit about what was going on up here and, and talk about sort of the patterns we see and the work that this larger group has been doing to try to understand um, Highway 2 in particular. So along the highway, we call it the US 2 corridor, um, because it isn't just a highway. It's the highway, there's a railroad that goes along it, and then for a large part of it, there's also rivers or creeks. And um, any one of those things can potentially act as, uh, can make an animal not choose not to go through that particular area. 
Um, and so with the grizzly bear data in 2004, uh, on the western half, so uh, we're over here in East Glacier, um, and maybe, maybe the easiest way to, to describe this is over on the east side where we're at, starting there, those um, animals looked a little bit different, but not, not super, super different. But on the left side, in the western half, they looked really, really, really different. Um, and this is what, when you pull off the, the uh, land ownership and just look at like um, the details of the road, the road system, it looks like underneath. And so um, what we think this was related to, at least at that time when there were fewer animals, is that the, this road system and all of those developments that were in the western half were probably acting as at least a partial barrier to animals. So now, since then, with, as, this, as the bear population increased, we think that it's become um, more connected based on that, uh, the other stuff I was talking about. Um, so when we think about connectivity of animals between one place and another place, and we think about how to conserve it, um, a lot of times people start out thinking about at a really big scale. So, uh, I can't remember this analysis, this uh, evaluation was done uh, for the crown of the continent or Montana or North America, but in any case, they decided the way that they approach this and the way a lot of people approach this is to sort of identify some big places, some general locations using these big polygons or arrows and say, this is an important area for connectivity. And here is one of those areas. So, so we're here on... There's Glacier Park, the outline, and then you can see this is where US2 comes through, and this is basically like one important connectivity area um, after another, and that's this is one particular um, assessment of that. But there were there's been many different kind of looks at this sort of scale, this sort of big picture that have all said the same thing that US2 is this major road system that's fragmenting. Um, to these two areas that are largely protected quarter areas, so Glacier Park to the north, and then the Bob Marshall Wilderness to the south. Um, and of course, the Bagger Two Medicine is a piece of that that's also connected to that area. So um, this is traffic, um, and this is actually looking at two uh, different decades of traffic, and now it's almost a decade old, but the, the um, open squares, which are on the bottom in this graph, and then the closed square, the closed one, so this, this lower one is 1999 to 2001, and this is by day of the week. And so you can see that there's a... The a, arrow doesn't show up. Oh, it doesn't so show! Right. So, yeah. What will I do? I will speak this with a pointer. I'm glad you told me that. This is, how, no, this is gonna turn the things on and off. Okay. No wait, it does have a it has a thing on for the pointer. No, okay. I'll just talk it. Oh wait, is this one? I don't, this I don't know. That might be the remote for the projector. Right. You want a pointer? I'll just walk up. I'll just walk around. I'm okay with it. I'll just try not to trip. Okay, so traffic. So okay, so here's here's the stuff in um, 1999 to 2001. So it's down here. Um, and then this is 2012 to 2013, which is up here. Um, and so this is by day of week, and you can see there's a strong pattern where the weekends are busier than the weekdays. Um, and Friday especially is busy in both those time periods, but there's a lot more traffic. Um, and then this is showing it by hour, um, and we also see it's pretty low in the middle of the night, um, so if you don't want to wait for anybody to be driving slowly and you have to wait driving fast, um, that's the time to do it, although you might see more animals in a bad way in that case. Um, but then as the day goes on, uh, the traffic increases and it hits, uh, different levels. And so the biggest changes then between those two time periods was really um, going in that in the middle part of that day. But it's also 
uh, extending earlier into the morning as well. Um, so this was based on some traffic counters that that um, the carnivore biologist put out to sort of see how they continue. And you might be wondering maybe what this this line here is, um, and that's the hundred vehicle per hour line, and that's the line at which um, in a group of bear study that that John Lauder conducted that uh, back in 1999 2001, that was the the line the time the amount of traffic at which very few grizzly bears crossed the road. So he found that they were crossing in the, in the evening and crossing in the morning when the traffic volumes were low, but not when it was high. And so what, what John's thinking is going on here is that between this time and this time, now um, the grizzly bears have to move their behavior back and, and act. When they do want to cross the road, they have to cross it more in the nighttime, early in the morning, even earlier in the morning. And when you kind of look at that across um, overall in those two decades, uh, you can see that that there's um, big shifts on average uh, as you go um, between those early time periods and the late time periods. And that's just the two different places where who's measuring traffic volume. Okay. So um, Okay, this is just a, a picture of um, one of the places where they're actually all stacked up against each other. Um, so you, you can see the, the highway and the railroad track and the river all next to each other. So you can think about that and if you were an animal trying to get from one side to the other, how difficult that might be, especially right there. Well, so people have um, been working on these kinds of issues in a lot of different places for a long time. Um, and they've come up with some approaches to deal with that. And one of, one of the things that they've done is to work on crossing structures. So um, you may have seen this one if you were coming from far away, uh, if you came up from the south. Um, this is the Animals Bridge over on the Confederated Salish, uh, the Confederated Salish <coughs> Kuti Tribes land, the Black Reservation. Um, and it's a, it's a really nice example of an overpass. Um, uh, a lot of uh, grizzly bears and some other species tend to like to be able to see what what is coming. They they like that big open view, and so it's thought that for uh, some species, especially these overpasses, are better. Um, and have been been shown. And then then there's these culverts, which of course are much tinier. They're used for water. Um, and I think those are wool tracks in there, if I remember right. Um, but, but they can also be used by animals. Probably if it was as rainy uh, there right now <laughs> as it is here outside, it might have a little bit more water, might be not very helpful. And then, and then there's these underpasses, and um, this is an example of, of a bear using an underpass. Um, and, and one of the things is with these is that they have been shown to reduce um, road hills. And so in Banff National Park where they have a a pretty um, extensive system. Um, they've had an eight percent reduction in road fills, and um, down in the Confederated Salish uh, Kootenai Tribe Flat Reservation, they had um, uh, in different areas a seventy eight to eighty percent reduction. So that was a lot of background um, for what I really wanted to talk to you about, which was this, this interagency working group that uh, has been working together. Um, in a loose collaboration for, I think, five or six years now. And so um, we, uh, John Waller and myself, were, were really interested in trying to uh, bring together, start a conversation around what do we know about this U.S. Highway 2, um, what would we like to know, um, and how do we you know, make sense of what's out there. And so we brought together this working group um, and wrote a report about it where we specifically focused on identifying information gaps. Um, and so with that, we were able to uh, not only ask what were the information gaps, but also address uh, some basic questions. So this is uh, um, carcass information. So this is just about road hills on Highway 2. 
and we saw them increase. So between 2001 and 2015, there were quite a few, quite a bit more. Um, the same thing with collisions. Um, and then we identified um, a whole list of information gaps. Um, we brought in people from um, of most of the adjacent landowners. Uh, and so the Blackfeet Nation, of course, the park, um, myself, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Montana Department of Transportation, Montana Fish and Wildlife Park, uh, University of Montana Partners, um, uh, BNSF, and the Confederate Social Security Tribe. Um, and there was a pretty high level of participation at these meetings, um, which suggests that, that this issue was a high priority not only for all these different entities nationally that had taken a look at this, but, but locally as well. <laughs> and what we found was that we had some data, but not really, um, it, it was kind of all a little bit dissatisfying in one way or another. Um, so we had some data on grizzly bears and on wet bears, uh, some of the work that I just shared with you about from John Waller, and we had some genetic work, but in Mount Goats and the Parks, but they weren't really all analyzed in terms of the highway and thinking about crossings and thinking about an actual strategy to maintaining connectivity. They were collected for other reasons to look at, you know, how many bears are there or um, you know, diff different lots of different things. And we had almost no fine scale data, like collectively as a group across all these different people on um, elk, deer, small mammals, birds, and small carnivores. Um, They've done some work on uh, trying to get information from uh, uh, the train engineers and other experts, uh, which we called the CLUE study. And then, again, the uh, Department of Transportation and, um, had, and the uh, Highway Patrol had this purpose and collision data. Um, and so there's also a whole bunch of other GIS layers that were just real small scale. So we took a look at this and said, well, what can we learn from the information we do have? And um, one of the things we learned is that most of the carcasses are actually on the far west of the city, so over on the Columbia Falls end. Um, that most of the animal trails were very near culverts, so almost half of them were within 120 meters of a culvert. And that's important, and the reason we asked that question was because we were wondering, well, if these culverts just got upsized, so it's a pretty easy thing to do. You go to a road, and instead of putting the same teeny tiny culvert in, you put a bigger culvert in, and maybe that means that more different species are happy crossing them. Um, and we also found, sadly, that um, of the six locations that were recommended to be highway crossings across lots of different reports, um, uh, one was undergoing reconstruction, and only four of the others seemed suitable um, at this point in time. And so, there's, I would say, there's already been a loss of opportunity to some extent to try to maintain connectivity. Um, some other needs that we found at that point in time, um, uh, we suggested working with the, the state, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, we ident they identified that. If they could geofence, get some colors, so it's called geofencing, but you basically make an outline on a map of the area of interest, and then whenever a bear goes into that area, it can switch its programming so that instead of recording a GPS location once every five hours, it can go and switch and record it every 10 minutes, which could give us some better fine scale information on what bears do when they're crossing the road. Um, uh, USGS would be looking for opportunities to analyze some of this existing data in different ways. And then um, the park and Colorado State University and USGS uh, had some work on mountain goats coloring with multiple objectives that, that considered to be important at that time. Um, we also talked a lot about what we would do with that data. And um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but there's a, a framework called circuit theory. So is, is anybody an electrician out there? Not today? Okay. Darn. Um, it's, such a, it's such a cool thing. Um, so uh, basically, it's using the same theory about electricity that's used to like talk about electricity. And we think of animals then as um, electrons moving through the system, just like electricians think about electricity. 
Um, and so we can do a lot of modeling using data to inform where there might be more movement or less movement based on this framework. Um, and so the picture on the left is kind of an example of a map, and this is looking between the Whitefish Range over to the west of us and even further west. And those red areas are areas where there's a lot of constrained movement. And so those are like places that might be really valuable for conservation. And so um, the group thought that that would be a potential useful way to think about approaching this and to try to think about how can we combine all these different pieces of data about grizzly bears and um, wolverines and other species that we care about. And then we, as a group, sought um, some more for some more funding, and we were able to get enough to do this uh, local knowledge mapping. We called that the Mapathon. Um, uh, oh, wait, I'm still talking about these. We're going to answer that though in a minute here. <laughs> um, and then another thing that we wanted to do was put out some local uh, data trap, update the covert information, and continue to map um, where the trails were across this way. Okay, then we got the money. Then we get to do this. So our goals here with this were to identify places, um, observe wildlife crossing locations, um, and again for this mitigation purpose. And so uh, we put all this stuff in a report, and this next several slides are going to be kind of talking about what we learned from, from all of that. Um, so we were able to get from people's observations of crossing, and so, and so I guess I should back up and say, the reason we were interested in doing this is because, um, you know, I've been living in this area for a really long time. Um, I've seen one grizzly bear uh, and one mountain lion cross Highway 2 in all of the times that I've driven back and forth. And so whenever something is rare, it's hard to observe it in a lot of different ways. And so we thought, well, I remembered when I saw that. I might be biased because I'm really interested in connectivity, but maybe other people would remember some of these things too. And so they did. Um, so we had actually quite a few, uh, I'm not sure if that's, I think it's over 20 different observations of grizzly bear crossings of the highway where people remember, you know, with some level of detail where they where they saw the grizzly bear cross the road. Um, over 60 moose crossings, um, uh, wolves, a few mountain lions, um, black bear, and lots of elk. And um, you know, so that all adds to our information that we didn't have before. But that's the combined list. Um, the crossing ones was uh, a little bit smaller, but we also knew um, what kind, we reported what kind of, uh, if it was an actual crossing or if it was a, a dead animal in the road. Um, most of those observations were in the summer, uh, and that could be for a lot of different reasons, but um, we reported that as well. Um, and, and this is sort of a general picture of, of what we found from all of those people that, that provided observations to us. Um, and so there's some hot spots in there. Um, we would expect, based on the fact that people drive back and forth locally a lot, that there's more observations in some areas just because of that. And so. Um, it's not too surprising that our map kind of reflects that. Then we also put a bunch of cameras out on the road, and um, we put them at five different locations that were these areas that were previously identified to be important, and we deployed them for, uh, in this case I'm sharing some of the data from um, about five months of data, and we checked them. And deer and elk were, of course, the most frequent, but there was also a lot of other species. And so um, this is just one location where it might make sense to put a crossing structure. Um, and doing so might help, again, get across that combined set of uh, restrictions. Um, and at this site, we saw mostly white-tailed deer, but we also saw moose, elk, um, and black bears. And that, so we have one, one graph for each side of the highway. But it basically looked about the same on each side. Um, then we have one that's a site that's kind of near the goat lick, and in that one, um, we mostly saw elk, actually, um, but also saw mule deer and a few other things. Devil Creek um, is about halfway across the 
the between here and uh, West Glacier. Um, and we saw both white tail and mule deer there. On, and then on one side of the road, we actually also saw a lot of elk um, near Marias Pass. Um, we saw a, a lot of mule deer. Um, and then, um, but we also saw things like coyotes and bobcats and fox. And then finally, the last site, um, Summit Creek, um, a mix of white-tailed deer, um, mule deer, and actually quite a few humans. <laughs> Which maybe, you know, that, that ask, makes you ask the question, is it a good place or, or is there some human interference? Um, we mapped um, uh, nearly all of the coverts, um, but we skipped uh, a few places where, that were, where there were safety considerations. Um, and we found that most game trails were still within um, 100, the game trails and culverts were still within 100 meters, um, so still very close. And so that that idea of like the low hanging fruit of possibly when a road is reconstructed, putting in a bigger culvert might be really beneficial. Um, and we did see that most of them were really quite tiny. So um, most of them were less than a meter tall. So, you know, this big. So maybe, you know, a bear could probably squeeze through there, but will it want to? I don't know. Probably not. And then we also did some things like just pull together all the different um, historic places that people have said this is important uh, when they're looking at that finer scale. So remember at the beginning I talked about the broad scale and making broad circles. This is like a little bit more fine scale. And so based on what we saw, you know, what would be the, the highest priority places compared to the study that happened in earlier and you know all these different sort of people taking different looks at that. Um, we also identified some some areas that could be potential um, and recorded what people thought about those. Um, and now um, after we finished that report we're continuing to do work and uh, again it's kind of this loose collaboration of people working on different things. Um, and really at this point, we're trying to keep in touch about what people are doing and um, hopefully we'll be able to come back together to, to uh, pull those things together. So we're addressing those needs. So this is one, I, I showed this graphic earlier where we, John looked at the traffic volume in 1999 and then we looked at it in, around 2012 and now it's 2022 and he's got his traffic volume counters out there again. And so we'll see whether, uh, I mean, I hope we don't have that big of a jump again, but we know that the recreation use in this area has um, really increased, and we also have a lot more people living in this area, so we will find out. Um, we were able uh, to get money for fish logs and parks to be able to put out some colors that have that geofencing capability. Um, I'm not sure if they're out on bears yet, if this just, this just happened. Um, or, uh, but, but we were expecting that, you know, within the next couple of years, we will have some fine scale data that we'll be able to look at for this address. And then in terms of myself, um, I've been working with a number of uh, students and collaborators to try to work on that existing, those existing data sets. And so I thought I'd just run through that real quick so you, so you can see what it looks like, what the projects are. So um, we had Blackbeard data from that giant uh, grizzly bear data study that I told you about, all the genetics. And so I have a student who's working now to look at the connectivity of the black bears and model it using that circuit, circuit theory approach and basically try to identify where are the places where the black bears run across the road, where are the places that might be pinch points that might be high value for conservation. Um, we had existing bighorn sheep data and we that are that is spread out across the east quality side of the park. And so that's the, the blue and the pink dots on the right side are the males and females. And of course I'll sit down right here. Right when I wanted to use it. There, okay, this one. So so we had um, animals spread across the side of the park, and uh, Marie Tosa, uh, a student working with me, um, uh, has been looking at the connectivity between um, so actual contact rates between individuals based on GPS collar data and found that there's these three large divisions within the park um, where these 
similar to what I was sharing with the visitors, these um, uh, bighorn sheep don't look very much like these bighorn sheep, and the strongest divisions being here at St. Mary Lake. So these sheep really don't look like these sheep. Um, and that's useful to understand because, um, particularly because disease is also an important question when it comes to connectivity. So, so you want animals to be connected so they can exchange their genes and basically be a bigger population. But if a, if a species is really susceptible to disease, there's some risk with that as well. And then we've been looking directly at bighorn sheep connectivity and movement. Um, and so uh, I post up in the flesh has already done some work at the statewide scale and now she's focusing in on Glacier Park with me and, and looking at some of these questions again using that circuit um, approach to try to actually make maps that will show where the movement is uh, highest and, and model that so we can look at future scenarios as well. And then I'm not going to go into detail about this either, but we are doing um, some similar work with mountain goats. And so this summer, we're, uh, my team is collecting uh, pellets um, across the park to try to see if the mountain goat population has a similar kind of structure as the bighorn sheep population. Is it one big uh, mixed group or is it three separate populations? Um, and we're doing that because we did some analysis of the citizen science data that the park's been collecting for years, and, part, and this is all in partnership with the park. Um, and we saw declines of uh, nearly 45% um, across between 2008 and 2019. Um, and then there's also some concurrent goat uh, research that's going on with some collared goats. Um, Mark Beal, who I think you're you're having next week, or next, not next week, next in three weeks. The 13th. Like, the 13th is going to probably tell you in great detail about that. And so I will not spoil his uh, talk, and you should come and see it. He's a great speaker. Um, and then over here on the Blackfeet Nation, they've been really interested in the, these animal vehicle collisions, and we've been working on a, a master plan to try to reduce that. Um, there's There's been some other highways that have been reconstructed um, and the Department of Transportation is looking to, has been looking to see whether now that they've reconstructed it, they're, they're getting grizzly bears to use that, that underpass that they put in. Um, so Paul Stern with the Montana Department of Transportation has been looking at this and they do have a few grizzly bear crossings in each direction at each of these two sites that we've been monitoring. Um, they do also, have some grizzly bears that are attempting to cross over the road as well. And then there is, of course, the e, &E initiative that's going on on the Blackfeet Reservation where they're looking at reintroducing bison. Um, and so there's a, 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 a master student, Joanne Kitson, who um, previously worked on Highway 89 and, and helped me uh, actually help us deploy those remote cameras that I was talking about along Highway 2. And he's now um, uh, working on, for his master's, looking at the, the uh, connectivity of bison in the future, trying to predict where those where they will move um, once they are reintroduced. And then finally, the other large project that is, that is building up is a project trying to assess elk connectivity. And so this is a, a project led by the tribe um, in Glacier National Park, where um, uh, we deployed uh, around 75 GPS collars on elk in their wintering range. And um, uh, graduate student Daniel Bird is looking at assessing where those connectivity, where are those pinpoints, and again, uh, trying to say where, where are the places that are important for us to conserve. One last thing is we identified a bunch of other needs. Um, so you can tell, like some of these are huge projects. I don't know if you can tell, but some of these projects are like huge projects. They're you know several hundred thousand dollars to complete. Um, some of them are relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, a technician for a summer. Um, there's still more, many more things to be done. But some of them are small. There's some. Uh, it'd be useful, I think, to look at. Uh, evaluating from an engineering perspective some of these potential crossing structure areas on the highway. 
Um, we have not max guardrails. Um, there's a lot of still a lot of species we won't have any information on yet. Um, but I think the biggest thing is is the next the biggest next step um, is trying to figure out how what kind of planning process we want to use now to integrate all of these different analyses and, and think about a multi-species connectivity plan. So we can be able to say these are the areas that are most important, um, these might help the most species, and have that conversation. Also, um, thinking about some of the other values that exist along the highway corridor. So this whole talk I've been talking about wildlife and uh, bears and um, some of these important species, but there's also um, the concept of wilderness. There's the concept of what is it like to drive along that highway and see that scenery. If we put a crossing structure in, but then we also have to add fences that direct animals to that crossing structure, what does that, how does that change the character and, and what are we, um, is that what collectively we're interested in? So there's, there's a lot of other things that I haven't really even talked about. Um, so with all of that, um, I hope that gives you at least an introduction to all the different things you can think about when you're thinking about just this one little <laughs> highway uh, corridor that's just right out the door um, and, and all these different species and trying to keep them connected. Um, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, all the agencies and people from those agencies that have participated in this project. Um, uh, lots and lots of help, um, and all the people who particularly worked on these reports that I've shared. I'd like to also especially thank the Glacier National Park Conservancy, which provided funding in multiple different ways for many of these different data collection and analysis um, efforts that I've talked about. And then there's a whole bunch of other funders for these different pieces um, that I that I haven't uh, listed specifically, but that have been really important. And with that, if I would be happy to take any questions you want. So I I do have one on the connectivity off of Highway Two. Do um, how close possibly are we getting for um, bridges, culverts? I mean, are we talking years down the road for this once the rest of your studies are done? Well, or? so it's a good. That's a really good question. And so the highway department has a list of priorities. Um, sort of statewide, you know, because it's, it's run through the state. Um, and in the short term, there are not uh, major reconstruction efforts. Um, the process to do some kind of major reconstruction effort is usually a, a can be up to a 10 year process. Um, and in the past, there really hasn't been um, good ways of putting in things about wildlife early on in the process. And so in the past, in really all across the country, a lot of times what would happen is that is that uh, the engineers would decide what to do and they're, they're going off of things like highway safety. Um, they do have some environmental concerns. Um, they tend to be more hydrological, the things that they tend to think about first. Um, and so they would make a plan and then the wildlife biologists would often hit a, hear about it or be asked for feedback like a year before it happened. Um, and that was really challenging because at that point they'd already done all the engineering and put tons and tons of money on this one particular approach to putting the highway or you know making the highway bigger or putting it in a particular spot. And so redesigning that is then really, really expensive to do. And that creates a lot of, um, it's just not a great situation in terms of long-term planning. And so, and so now, I mean, I've talked a little bit about some of these projects. Some of these projects have taken, like, literally um, on the wildlife side, years and years and years to complete. And so um, what we're, we're hoping is that uh, over, as we're building this information up, we can start to be in a position where uh, we can identify priorities early enough that that can be incorporated when, when, transportation planning happens. Um, 
And then the, the thing that the other thing that the transportation, uh, our transportation partners have shared with mm -hmm. us is that really there's just things that come up. And so I, I don't know actually if it's happened this year with these floods this year, but um, very often floods can happen or something can happen and then a culvert washes out or is damaged. And so sometimes the transportation department comes in and does a, uh, can do a spot fix. Um, and so things like identifying, yeah, there's a lot of small culverts and it could be a good thing to upgrade some of those um, can be really useful for them to know and to know that a large group of people think that's important. So that when that comes up and there's not a lot of time to respond and plan, there's not a lot of planning for us and they, they have that information and know that it's important. How many years did it take for the Sandwich Kootenai to finish their project? They're still working on it. Um, so uh, that's a really good question. I don't remember when. So the the politics are very different in that situation because of the the tribal sovereignty, um, where tribes actually have the potential to have a big say over what's going on in there reservation um uh, and so i think they actually designed the connectivity plan the initial one very quickly um like it's six months or something i don't know how long it actually took after that to get the engineering to happen and, and to put it all in place but it was it was a multiple year project to get the first version done and um overall they did a really great job i think and they put in a, a very large number of uh, Crossing structures, and um, but there's a few places where they, they didn't get it quite right, and so they're going back now and trying to um, do a better job with those in various ways. So um, you know, you know, we all learn from the process. Uh, but but overall, they did a, they did a really good job. They already had a lot of local knowledge that they were able to build on in that situation too. Go ahead. Would be the next species of flower, okay? Ooh, um, mm, that's a tough one. So one of the things that the, the group talked about a lot with the coloring is, um, so when you you're you're kind of gambling a little bit. So um, you don't know which animals are going to cross the road, and it, it's expensive and hard to color color animals, right? Um, I don't know if any of the the elk that were colored out on the reservation are going to cross US 2 or if they're all going to stay further north. Um, and so, like planning a project that only has a single focus in mind um, can be, it, it, you might miss basically. So, so, you have to sort of set it up to be multiple, hopefully, have multiple objectives, some that are maybe a little, like a little lower hanging fruit to be able to attain that. And then Hope you get some more information about the, this other thing too. So, so like if we were to collar wolverines, which is actually pretty difficult to do, but if we were going to do that, <laughs> you know, where would we get, you know, where would we get the sample size of wolverines in order to be able to get them to cross the room? Um, I don't know. I think it'd be pretty interesting to do something like mountain lions, um, just because they probably are crossing are crossing pretty frequently, but they're pretty hard to observe otherwise. Um, but there's probably enough of them that you could get a a reasonable sample size to get some good information. Well, if you need help, Kevin, I know a guy. What would you do? I don't know. We can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's so it's tricky, but um, you know, again, with the uh, the health project has multiple objectives, um, and you know, and and I don't think that's unreasonable to have multiple objectives. It's just you have to kind of keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out what you want to do. Yeah, we are seeing some of those colored up on the east side of two dog. Great. Yeah. Nice one. Okay. So, so if, when you were talking about the genetic stuff, it seems like you managed to sample on average a, a bear six times. Did you ever sample a bear on both sides of route two? Um, yes, yes. There were a few that were um, on both sides. The sample size uh, was pretty low. I don't remember the exact numbers. Um, um, and we, we thought about looking at like questions like are they going north to south more or south to north more and we we really didn't have the sample size to be able to do very much with that data. Um, but yes, they were they were crossing at least occasionally. Um, I know one 
of them, one of those actually, one of those was a, a female that moved all the way from the very southern part of the system up here. Um, and I can't remember where exactly she went, but it was like a really, really giant movement, especially for a female. So do you only get to do this kind of thing for bears, or do you do you do for lots of other animals? So you you can do these similar kinds of analyses for for really I mean any other species. It's just that uh, the because of the the high level of interest and charismatic nature of bears, there was enough funding being put into them to be able to actually attain that level of data. Um, the family tree methods you need to have a certain proportion of the population. <coughs> Uh, color or you know recorded um, for it to be very useful. Um, if you only have you know ten percent of them colored, you're not going to find those connections between the parents and the offspring very very commonly. But for for grizzly bears, the the state and their trend monitoring that they've continued has continued to collect the genetic data, and so um, that we we can continue to do more in terms of understanding that at least for grizzly bears. But yeah, it's, it's hard. But but some of the other things are not. So the like the, the genetic structure, um, you don't need to have as much of a proportion of the individuals to be able to tell that there's one population or two that the population is mixing or not. So the bighorn sheep is an example. We saw um, we found one animal that moved across St. Mary um, Lake, and that's it. So not very many. It's probably not the only one, but. They look pretty different still. Go ahead. If individuals or groups wanted to dive in and help with this effort, mm -hmm. what what would you suggest? Where would, where would you start? Um, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, it, it's hard for me to know what what the answer to that is right now at this point in time. I mean, I, I do think. Um, the, the approach that uh, that uh, we've been talking about in terms of collecting citizen science data that's a little bit more regular would be really valuable. So there's sort of weaknesses with the, the data that we've collected so far that, you know, so it's like people remembering where they saw the grizzly bear across the road. Um, and the collision and carcass data is sampled very unevenly. Um, you know, that's not that's not like somebody is that's not their full time job where they're going through and marking every carcass. And so that bias that I talked about about there being more in certain places where there's more people. Um, so so if there's a way to kind of record effort in addition, that would be one thing that I think would be really useful. So so you know, people drove there five times and they recorded five dead deer. Okay, that's that tells you something. Um, when you compare that with a different area that 10 people drove on, but they didn't see any dead deer. So you have more confidence than that where, where they're seeing the dead deer are really the, the hot spots. Tabitha, did you know that we've already got an app going with that information? Yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I don't know if you have an effort, but yeah. But, but you have the recording of it. So that's okay. Good. Yeah. We'll make sure that we put an effort on it. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you have um, plenty of data for the crossing of the road. I'm just wondering if the railways provide any uh, data for you for the crossing of the railroad crossing? Um, not a lot. Not a yeah, lot. They, um, yeah, not a lot. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, is it, yeah, like yeah. as a citizen science kind of project. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that could be useful if, if there were other places where, uh, I, I think, because, uh, yeah, I think it would be enough interest on the homeowners along Highway 2. I have no idea. Uh, um, it's a good question. I have no idea. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, like, you can't just put a camera up along the road. You have to get permits and stuff to be in the highway right away and things like that. And there's um, there's some privacy considerations. You have to make sure the cameras aren't focused on the cars that are going by and things like that. Um, uh, so, there, so there's some steps, I guess, 
that that would have to be done, but that that could be very interesting in helping us understand what's going on on more than five places along this, you know, really quite long highway for sure. And and I should say my role is research, and so um, so uh, that because of that, my my focus is on the research side of things and on the, the information. And so I can't really address the, you know, what should happen more in more of a social, um, political context as uh, other folks are more in charge of that. Yeah. So I got a question. Has anyone mapped the, uh, you said the water availability of harvest data from Montana Highway Patrol and mm -hmm. got and theoretically there should be from Burlington or in Santa Fe that be willing to share that data. Um, has anyone mapped that and found either alignment between where animals are being hit on the railway and the highway, or alignment between carcass like hot spot concentrations and then some other actually places animals are trying to cross with any frequency rather than just being hit? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I feel like um, so the there was a a study earlier where they did get a lot of uh, railroad information about. About um, I think both crossings and collisions, but it's been a long time since I looked at that data set. Um, I don't think it's been sort of lined up and you know trying to sort of do that comparison that you're talking about. It is the railway. Are they required to notify to collect that data if you know they hit a bear with the with the trains or anything? Mm -hmm. Are they required, or do if they do it? If it's or? an endangered species, they are supposed to um, record that and report it. Um, okay. But for deer, uh, things like that, I don't know exactly what their what their requirements are, but they're not anywhere as stringent. I just remember a few years back there was a big hoopla within because there were several bears yeah. that were killed along there, and they were shunned pretty, you know, by several, you know, of the public in regards to, you know, why are they not doing something, you know, are they reporting it and whatnot. So I didn't know if it was a required, I mean, you know, if they don't say anything, you don't know. Yeah, just in general, if the species is listed as endangered, uh, everybody is required to report it if they find it. Um, mm -hmm. but, and in that case, it's... Um, they do. They have a formal consulting process with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who's responsible for the management of endangered species. Okay. Um, the at least one of the issues with trains, in particular, and, and grizzly bears, is is the when there is a grain spill, in particular, um, and that is an attractant for grizzly bears. So, so they come and they then are put on the track, and then of course that increases mm -hmm. the potential for them to. So it's a it's a there's a cleanup process involved, um, and so that's something that's been um, uh, an ongoing discussion in general between the Fish and Wildlife Service and and railroads. And I, I don't know exactly what their uh, current I don't have the details on there. The current agreements and um, uh, all of that at this point in time, but but it is something that is a known um, challenge, right? Yeah, just remember a few years ago, it was really bad. I think it was, I uh, remember how many. Mm -hmm. like yeah. It, so, yeah. And it, they've done a lot to um, fix and repair grain cars. Um, but again, as you. Sure. You fix them and then they get old eventually. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, it's not something that's probably ever completely, a process that's completely done. This is great. We've got time for one more question. Are there any other burning questions out there for Tabitha before we wrap up this evening? Of course, she'll stick around if you want to ask her questions personally for a little bit, I'm sure. Well, thank you so much. Let's give her a round of applause.